Tubby and Coos fans. It is me, Candice. I'm the owner of Tubby and Coos Mid-City Bookshop coming at you live from the bookstore for this amazing author event. I am so excited about this event because we get to talk to both the author and the audiobook reader, which is really, really cool. And both of these people are amazing. And I am such a fanboy and I'm so excited that they're here today. We are celebrating Fondalee's third book, which I don't have yet, unfortunately, but it's on its way, called Jade Legacy. Uh, Jade City It was the first book in the trilogy. And this trilogy is amazing. If you have not read it yet, I do recommend the audiobook because we also have the audiobook reader. So Fonda is the World Fantasy Award-winning author of Jade City and also the award-winning YA science fiction novels, uh, Zero Boxer, XO, and Crossfire, born and raised in Canada, uh, Lee is a black belt martial artist, which is super cool, a, co a former corporate strategist and an action movie aficionado who lives in Portland, Oregon. And we also have Andrew Cascino, who is a voice actor, and he's been doing it for a really long time. And I know that you have watched something that he has voiced at some point with all of my nerd folk out there. So he has voiced uh, characters in Clone Wars, uh, Star Wars Rebels, The Bad Batch, and Star Wars Visions, even Disney Junior stuff like Lion Guard and Nickelodeon's uh, The Casa Grandes and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Steven Universe and The Regular Show. He has voiced voiced several national commercial campaigns as well, and a whole bunch of video game stuff uh, like Ghost of Tsushima, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, Call of Duty Black Ops, Spider-Man Miles Morales, Final Fantasy, Days Gone. So like you've definitely heard his voice in something. So I'm so excited to have you both. Hello, Fonda and Andrew. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Candice. Thank you Thanks. so much. Yeah, and I do want to encourage everyone to, of course, buy books. We have physical copies and audiobooks that you can get through us. And I want to mention if you have any questions, there will be Q&A at the end. So feel free to drop any questions in the chat for that. And with that, I will let y'all have a conversation. I'm so excited to listen. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Fonda. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. I got a book coming out in two weeks. So, it's so a little excited mad right now, but I'm super excited. I am so glad I get to chat with you. Uh, it really feels like we've been on this journey together and it's crazy that it's coming to a close. Um, so I, I've, I said this a little bit before um, when we were backstage, but I get I get so many compliments on the audiobook. I have, I have so many readers who came to the books through the audio version and fell in love with them and with your characterization. And I just, I honestly could not have asked for uh, a better person to bring these books to life. So thank you. I am just, I'm so thrilled. I, I am so, that is, I'm just humbled hearing that because quite honestly, back to you, I, you, it really entrusted me to hold your characters tightly to my chest and to give them to give them life in word like in sound and i took that responsibility to the greatest extent that i could because i knew how important it was and in doing so i became so attached to all of them that they were like family to me so that's how i approached reading it and i just i cannot I cannot tell you how honored I was to be able to follow everybody on this journey and to and to hopefully have done your words justice. Because uh, I, I hear yeah. your voice in my head sometimes when I'm revising and I'm, I'm <laughs> thinking about how this is going to sound uh, when you when, when you narrate the book. And I just I can hear your voice in my head when Hilo's talking or when Lon's talking, oh, and Jay's talking. So it's a it, it it's a, a really like a co-creation and it's sort of strange that like we're working so far apart we both work like in isolation but you know we come together and and people are experiencing something that's like both of us uh you know putting our our heart and soul into it which i would also say because i follow you on twitter and there are so many times when i've seen you during the process of writing say things about how your day has gone 
And they never fail to be so inspirational because even when it, it's something that's giving you some kind of adversity, it's always rooted in surmounting that obstacle and bringing it forward. So there's, it's that, even that just to be locked in in that aspect of it. And to also know, because, you know, I had read the prior two books, but to, to watch as the process goes along is to sort of have everything start bubbling in my head going, man, I wonder where it is right now. Like I could almost, <laughs> I could almost intuit where it was based on what you were saying. And I was like, oh, I can't wait. I cannot wait to read this book. So yeah. So what's it like for you, the, the process? Because I don't think we've talked about this before. I've always wondered, first of all, like when, when you got brought on, this would have been four years ago, over four years ago, when you, when you got asked to narrate Jade City, did you have, uh, what were your thoughts? Like, did you know that you were signing up to, for a trilogy that you were going to end up having to be uh, narrating a 27 hour <laughs> <laughs> novel, and, you know, four years later, how, how, what, how did you get brought into becoming an audiobook narrator because you have this long history as a voice actor. And, um, and what's the process like on your end? Because for me as the author, it's a little bit of a magic black box where I send in the manuscript and then like, ta-da, there's like this brilliant, beautifully narrated product that comes out the other end. Well, f well, first of all, thank you again. Thank you. Um, the, the process is kind of interesting because audiobooks by definition, relative to the other things that I do are very definitely a marathon, not a sprint. So part of it is ensuring that there's going to be a consistent level of energy and a consistent tone throughout the book. So you can't sort of do the same thing that I may have done for, you know, obviously for animated shows or what have you, or for that matter, even cinematic video games, um, because there has to be an, a narrator that's an anchor. And then there have to be characters that have an elasticity of emotion. Right. So, it's kind of determining where that sort of center is and then kind of, you know, for lack of a better sort of, not to put it in a very granola sense, but putting it in that, centering that kind of energetically where it is right, and, right. and anchoring it there so that you know that everything kind of anchors on that one spot. So you don't start too high where it's kind of like everything start is pitched and overly elevated and it's not too low where it sounds like it's going to, you know, drone and fall asleep. Um, and that the characters also, and this is one thing I just love about all the characters you've written, is there are so many flavors of individuals where it's so fun to slide into them and then come back again. So right. that it made my job really easy. So when you, you had certain people like my all time favorite slash hated character, Barrow, is where it was so easy to slide into him because he was such a great contrast to the narration. And it was just like a delicious kind of piece to sink your teeth into and then bounce back, which also made him contrast off of other characters. For example, Shay being very logical and very steady and Hilo, you know, being obviously somebody somewhat more hot headed, but being confined by that sense of being, I'm part of a lineage. So and then obviously the cast of all the other characters that he bounces off of. So that it, it was, it's a very, as it is, I'm sure for constructing these characters, it's a very delicate process to kind of understand where they all are. And again, that I want to make sure that I'm honoring what you wrote. What you said is so interesting because it's really pretty similar to how I think about um, the writing of the books, because there is, there's an authorial voice, which is like right. my voice that carries through these books and the narrative and then there's each individual character's voice so that a chapter that is in say like Shay's point of view has a different flavor to it feels different than a chapter that's in Barrow's point of view and yet shot through all of that is is my authorial voice which kind of is sort of the foundation of it but there's that like you said there's like there's that elasticity of character voice um, mm -hmm. that you're weaving in and out. Um, and that's, it, that's, it's cool that that, that that translates between like what we both do. Definitely. There's one actually, there's a thing that I wanted to actually say to you that I've been dying to say to you for the whole, all, the entire series, which is, oh. which 
in the Candace mentioned in the intro, which was you're a martial artist. And, and, and I knew that from when we first met, when, you, when we had that discussion. Yeah. And one of the things that I love about these books is you write a fight the way a fight actually occurs. That a fight is not a finely choreographed dance between people that is very elegant and looks visually appealing. A fight is ugly and terrifying and exhausting and dangerous and reckless and um, subject to the, uh, the forces of fortune where you, you know, something may happen, you may get off a punch or you may catch something that like, you know, where someone catches you and you didn't expect it because they saw an opening. And it's like, you write like someone who knows how to fight and has been in a fight. And it's, I also noticed that, that, that from the, the, the nature of the sentences become tighter and mm -hmm. more tense during those fight scenes. So the energy just starts to like, everything starts to just constrict and get more full of that adrenaline of fighting. So it's almost visceral which is what a fight is, as opposed to intellectual when you read certain, like a lot of people when you read it, it's like, this look sounds pretty, but having been in a fight, it doesn't feel authentic. Well, I'm really glad to hear you say that because that's the, definitely the feeling that I wanted to evoke in those scenes. And I, I love writing those scenes. I don't know if you, if, you, if there's sort of a um, similar process for you when you're narrating them where it's like oftentimes for me, like the, the, the fight scenes, take a lot of time to get right. And then ideally when the reader reads them or when you read them, they should just flow really smoothly. So it's like you have to move slow to move fast, right? which is also like a, a martial art, mm -hmm. arts principle that applies in this case to, to the writing of those scenes where the more that I try to make them clear and, uh, and, uh, and, um, on point and smooth, hopefully the reader and the listener can just picture it with very little barrier between like the words and the images that end up in the head. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. Because I mean, I remember this one I can talk about because it was in the previous book was the fight between Shay and Aitmada, where that was so quick and abrupt but brutal and what what i don't want to spoil anything for the book what can i can i mention just the fight but not the context yeah yeah it's, okay between hilo and someone else where he is ostensibly impaired or drunk mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and even those two fights were so fascinating because all four all of the four combatants were highly skilled fighters, but the circumstances were so different. One was highly right, ceremonial. Right. One was subterfuge. Right. And right. so one was literally back alley, man, whatever happens, if I have to smash your head with a garbage can lid, I'm going to do it. And the other one was governed by this set of protocol, but both had this electric energy. And yeah, I mean, I certainly do not have a black belt. I did take martial arts, but I've been more than my fair share of fights both being on the receiving end <laughs> and on the end of dissing a few out. And it, I had that sort of visceral level where I kind of had to take a break for a second and be like, holy, this is really powerful because it, it pulls a lot out of me to be like, you're, I'm almost like breathing hard because I, I'm in that moment. So yeah, it, thank you. And th those, those passages were always just beautifully done in their in their energy and their and i mean it's the highest level of compliment brutality of what it is well i this just it's music to my ears to hear you say that especially because i know it can be i mean it's hard to to bring like your own you you've got to read for uh, hours and hours on end so uh, to hear that like those passages are really fun and like get you going and are enjoyable to actually narrate are that that makes me really happy to hear i, I think, do wonder i think I do, we, what, what it might be a good idea is just a quick side i think what might be a good idea is holding like a master class kind of thing where you invite authors to go i'm going to teach you about a fight 
<laughs> and that would be like, people would just be like, this is not what I expected. I got to rethink my way of doing this. I think that would be fantastic. <laughs> I've definitely done some panels where we talk about fight scenes because it's a topic that I, I, I love talking about um, because I, I love watching them. I love reading them. I love writing them. And uh, yeah, I've, I've definitely done some, <laughs> some, uh, some discussions like that. I've got to wonder how you approach the voices for the different characters. Like when you, when you first get the manuscript and you're reading through it, and um, how, how do you start to, to determine how you're going to approach each character and like, how do you make them distinct? Because like, like I said, some, I now hear your voice for some of my own characters um, it, it, the, when I think of my own characters talking. And uh, also, okay, and then I have to ask, do you have, do you have a favorite character to voice? Uh, a couple. Uh, Hilo, which I think I mentioned to you when we were on Twitter one time, I said Hilo is Hilo is the individual who I, an individual I know who is who I've known. We've been friends forever. He's far cooler than I'll ever be, but he's that guy. Um, and so he has that level of swagger, that level of laissez-faire, but is probably one of the toughest dudes I know. And he's yeah, all of that energy goes into Hilo. Uh, definitely Barrow, because Barrow is kind of like, Barrow is like, it's, it's like voicing him is sort of the, the, the tactile equivalent of wringing out a washcloth and just putting all your strength on it and just going, I just, like, you just, you really viscerally don't like this kid. And as he goes, because, again, not to be brutal, but it is kind of, and you see, I kind of have to laugh. You're like, who is going to kill this kid? Like, you just get really <laughs> mad because you're like, why does this kid keep ducking everything? Like, you just want to reach into the page, just smack this kid. Um, one of my other all-time favorite characters is Ike Mata. Because I, Ike Mata's voice, I want it to sound like a, like a blade's edge. Like just hearing her voice, there was, it almost felt like the danger of being too close to a very, very sharp blade that could mm. just cut you, that you wouldn't even realize you'd been cut until you, the blood just started to bloom out of the wound. Like that's, I wanted that level of, of unease and tension when you heard her voice mm -hmm. that was, that was sinister doesn't cover it, devious doesn't cover it, but uh, uh, also unctu not well, kind of unctuous, but more um, insidious is probably a better way of doing it. Something, someone capable of utterly vicious acts, but with this thin Grinch-like smile on her face. So I wanted, th I wanted that sort of like, in a world of people like Hilo, who has no problem raising his voice or flexing his abilities, I wanted someone who who, when she spoke, to me at least, what it spoke to was nothing phased her. Right. Absolutely nothing phased her. And even in the heat of facing death, there was this stone-faced smile that she could just glide through the moment and it would terrify you. So yeah, that those are a couple of my favorites. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of Zapunio was one of my favorites. Oh too. yeah, oh, I loved your your voicing of Zapunio because he that whole oh, that whole sequence it. was yeah. just like another person be like I hate this person, but at right. the same time, or I really dislike this person, but at the same time, you wanted him to have that level of power where you still had to be wary, right, and you right. you could you couldn't be like dismissive. So it was sort of this uh, that kind of. Um, Again, someone who would go to places that you would not. And that makes, no matter what circumstance it is, that always makes you uneasy. Whether it's in a fight, if you're fighting even with rules, if it's in business, if it's in friendships, wherever it is, if there's somebody who's going to go that extra length, it's like being up in a place where you got, you know, your boy's with you and then somebody is like, yo, and someone's like the ODB equivalent. You're like, oh, hey, yeah, when they're here, things might get a little crazy. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, and that that was kind of the the um, inspiration.
for, for yeah one of the other things i love that you did was the voicing of the hispanians especially the crew bosses oh that, that okay the thing with that was the and again it was sort of like seeing the hispanians going okay right away there's there's going to be a stratification of society right right and their propensity to uh use Kekanese, the Kekanese would be, we'll solve it by force and diplomacy, but we're, you know, whichever, if I have to snap your neck, that's fine. But if I have to also kind of just use aggressive, aggressive diplomacy where you think I could do it, that's fine too. And the Hispanians were, are much more of, no, we'll do things like bank fraud and money laundering. We don't dirty our hands with that. So to me, that spoke like to an RP level, RP English, BBC-ish type of an elegant level of crime, certainly a level of condescension, condescension and disdain for other people. So, of course, the natural kind of, uh, not evolution, but sort of cousin to that was the Hispanians who were on the outside are like, oh, this is kind of a Jason Statham kind of individual. Right, right. <laughs> who's, <laughs> like, who's, who's like, oh, I have no problem flipping over a table. Do not get it twisted. So that... That was also a lot of fun. That, that, oh, they were so a great. lot of fun. I thought that was, it was like a stroke of brilliance because I remember when, um, I, I, I think it was partway through the recording of Jade City that I got an email and it was from, from the, from the Shed Audio and they were like, hey, this is, this is what, uh, you know, Andrew and, and producer want to do with the with the Hispanians and giving them an accent and I was like that's brilliant <laughs> and so I remember that I was like I was so pleased when uh, when when I heard it it just it went it worked so well thank you and and to that to your again to your point is visual like in my head how I always had it was the 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 beautiful isolation of KCON and then. Espania is this other that each of them eye each other warily with this sense of 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 contempt and distrust and there's there's all these kind of yeah this like very, uneasy alliance uneasy alliance with them and they both also look down on each other's customs mm -hmm. so it was kind of like how does that feel and that goes from everything from you know. Uh, Oh shoot! I mean, I mean, I a lot of my friends who live in Brooklyn, they would be like, you know, oh man, I hate, I, I never go to the Bronx. I hate it. So you would be like, <laughs> right, these right. are five boroughs in the same city. But then <laughs> New Yorkers as a whole would be like, I'm not going to Jersey. Are you crazy? But then the Tri City area is like, man, you know, where the are you kidding? Like, I'm never going to Los Angeles. I'm not going to Atlanta. So it, it was this this sort of um, as the camera pulls out, right each subdivision of these things becomes less and less apparent because the larger group has a, you know, are positioned against other groups. So it's kind of like, as it sort of focuses in and out, it's like the, um, the mountain versus no peak. Then when you pull it out, it's Espanians and the Kekanese. And then when you pull it out, it, as you keep doing this, so it's, it's this constant focus in and out of everything where everything is woven together again, cool. to your credit, where it's, it's so, it's so dynamic and nothing, the lat, the spider web is always flexing and bending. But well, I gave you a you know. hard job because there were a lot of different groups that you came up with different accents for. The and I would, <laughs> I'd be writing these notes. I'd be like, so, you know, the Shotarians have got a different accent and there's like the Stepanish and then the Uiwa Islands. And then there's, you know, Spenia and then, you know, these people, but like the Kekanese who live in Shotar are going to sound, have to sound a little bit different than like, the regular Kaganese, because like they live in you know in, in very different circumstances as like as a diaspora of Shotar, and so I I gave you a hard job, and you meant you had to distinguish all these different places and these groups of people, including things like the um, the Kaganese community in Espania, who've got their own customs and uh, talk differently than the Kaganese from the home island. Which even as, because this is the thing, my hometown is Toronto. Yeah. So we both, we're both intimately familiar of how, uh, as Canadians, by Canadian by birth, how 
Francophones in Quebec have a very unique identity to French people living in France. Yeah. And the bond is still tight, but then there's still a level of tension between them because the Quebecois feel a certain, they have a, a very fierce mm -hmm, sense yeah. of pride and independence, yeah. and it is entirely different than the French. So it's all those things I've pulled on all those real world examples. Even the, the, even the wonderful thing about the whole uh, concept of the stone eye, which I thought was such a beautiful, um, such a beautiful way of articulating um, people who they felt were not pure. And as somebody who's half Japanese and half British, that was something I keyed and locked into so quickly where I was like, wow, Andon's experience, I, I totally get that. Like sort of being a part of, mm -hmm. but never quite being fully a part of. Mm -hmm. It was, again, I felt that viscerally. That was such a, be the, oh, that whole arc was so beautiful. And I loved that. Yeah, that was a really, really powerful thing for me personally. I I really wanted the idea of that of cultural diaspora and that of um, identity and trying to sort that out and Andon's journey to be really a big part of the of the series because I don't feel like I see it that much in, in fantasy fiction um, and you know oftentimes fantasy novels you've got like different races like elves and orcs and you know all the, all these different fantasy races but um you don't often you don't as often see the messiness of it right the like right. people migrate people move right. to different places there's diaspora communities and and hybrid identities and um different cultures mixing and mingling and and in in jade legacy that's so so much a big part of the theme is is societal change and the culture evolving and it's being like um, influenced by outside forces and it's got to modernize in order to survive. And so it, it's that I hope I, I tried to capture some of just like the, the sort of messy evolution of cultures and, and people. I, so I, I'm super curious about when you get like when this 700 page manuscript like lands on your desk and, and you have to prep to narrate it. What do you do? Like, do you read it all through and make notes? Do you like, um, what's, what's your process like? Well, the first time I had to read it all the way through, obviously, because it was the first time that I had seen any of these characters and was diving into the world. And, uh, the, second, um, the second book that I got, um, I went through it and the familiarity with the characters and knowing what they're, personalities was made it um uh it made it not i wouldn't say easier but what it did was it you could sort of it was easier to at least it was the familiarity provided an expediency in kind of knowing the situations and who was you know working with uh what was working with what and what everybody's motivations were right um really it was just sort of reading through it with great care i mean this is i don't know if i've ever told you this but um i'm pretty profoundly dyslexic. So reading the book was, it, I had to make sure that it was a, 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 an appropriate time of day and that I was uh, um, you know, well rested in the whole thing and taking it in those chunks to ensure that I could read it, to comprehend it, to make notes if I needed to, mm -hmm. but to read through it. So it was, um, it was, there was, a great degree of care that I wanted to ensure again, because I, you know, I really grew to love these people like family that I really wanted to make sure that I was imbuing it with that level of it, but also to kind of ensure that that first pass through was not going to be like the first pass through reading it per se, where I would be like, Oh, like, you know, the inability to read things properly was going to mess things up. So that was kind of, that was kind of a, a a very that was something I definitely had to do. Um, I am extremely grateful for readers' uh, newfound ability to highlight things. That was very <laughs> that helps a lot. So when you get that PDF, you can instead of kind of going, hmm, you know, maybe it's time to go and get my uh, my um, little uh, the the 
every time I send the book over or like I got the book and I'm like, I go to, there's a print shop that it's like my home girl. Who's like, I could print this for you. So it would be the last two books I got printed on paper. And this one, I was like, I'm gonna try this one on the iPad. So that actually helped a lot just sort of condensing it and getting the um, and having the notation and doing it that way. But yeah, prior to, I had it printed out on paper and I made notations by hand. So yeah, that was, that was kind of the process. How long does it actually take like for each, um, let's say like hour of recorded narration? For, for, I, can, I certainly can't speak to other, cause I know other people are like, you know, Tiger Woods with it where they can almost do like a one pass through sort of deal. Um, for me, if computationally now looking in hindsight, it's probably about 1.5 times the length of the finished thing. So this about 75 hours of, of doing stuff. Yeah. Um, because the other, and this is the other thing too, this is so fun too, is when I'm working with, uh, Dennis Ko, who's yeah. wonderful and absolutely hilarious. And I love him. Um, Sometimes we'll stop because we'll hit a passage and we won't, <laughs> we won't argue, but we will literally get into it going like, okay, wait, 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 wait. Like this is happening here. So we got to make sure that this, we got to make sure that, that, that this is how it moves, but we'll have like a little kind of a, like a, like a huddle obsession to go, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. This is super, like, it's all super important, but there may be something particularly like this has to be laid in. So we'll have mm -hmm. like this kind of like, back and forth and then and sometimes we'll be like no 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 it's gotta be like this you're like no 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 it's gotta be like this and but that process is so much fun because you know what it is, is we both care so deeply about it being right that when it finally gets to it we'll be, he'll always if he was right i'll be like ah you were right if i was right he was like yeah that was okay but he but he, <laughs> but, he but even having a teammate like that as opposed to working solo, especially on something like this, yeah. is so critical because you have someone who can go, because there would be it, there have been innumerable times where I've read something and you know, be like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. This, this needs a little more of this kind of energy. It's got, you know, he'll speak in terms of like, you know, it's got to take a bit of a right turn here or it's got to kind of slide through here. Like, and I'd be like, okay, yeah, I got you, I got you, I got you. Yeah. So, oh wow, it would be so cool to be a fly on the wall and listen to how how you guys make the magic. And I just feel I feel super blessed because um, I mean I was for for those of you watching, I was fortunate enough to meet Andrew and Dennis, the, uh, the producer. Um, in we were in L.A., weren't we? We were, we were in L.A. To, yeah, we yeah. were having to all be in town at the same time, and uh, and I just feel so lucky that both of you vibed with the book so strongly and it, it just like it just felt like a dream team for me like on my end I was like I'm, I'm just so grateful that uh, because I can I can tell like when um when someone's passionate about the work it just it comes through and uh, so I, I just I'm so lucky you both were immediately like I'm on board with this project speaking of lucky and I now I got I'm gonna have to dig up the name of the place if anybody who's listening right now is in Los Angeles, we had um, Fonda Dennis and I had the good fortune to meet at a place that in retrospect to me had the, the perfect texture and feel of the twice lucky. <laughs> it, was, it was like a, I, I remember, I'm trying to remember the name. I'm trying to remember it too. But it yeah. had the, it had the staircase upstairs. That's right. And, and then big it round had tables. Big round tables. And then there was uh, um, the carpet, which muted these these carts that were wheeled yeah, around. Yeah, all the dim sum carts. These, right, with, with, with these widely spaced tables and these high windows. And it was like, and then there was an area that was partitioned off. Much like the Twice right. Lucky, right, where right. it was like a, and it was like in retrospect, I remember going like, "That's really crazy." It was thematically fantastic, but what I remember most was that you couldn't eat anything because of shellfish yeah. allergy. And then I was like, "Oh, oh, oh next time we got to go to barbecue." Yeah, it's and then it's a pandemic happens. So let me tell chance. you how um how on a personal how the personal shame I feel being half Japanese and I can't eat seafood. Oh. It's, there's, a, there's a there's a particular shame in that. So yeah. 
<laughs> well, we gotta we gotta find a chance to uh, to go to barbecue. At oh some man, point. I got the spot. Trust me, oh, I, it's man. not twice lucky, but I got the spot. <laughs> so, how have things been for you over? I mean, you've been doing a ton of voice acting. Um, how? How has it been like over do ha, recording like over the last couple of years? Um, you and I both are kind of in that sense. Um, what we do is both singular and collaborative, right? Um, simultaneously. So at home, I have like the equivalent of what you where it's like you have your writer's room where yeah. this is everything you need, where everything kind of zones out. That's what you have. And I have the booth where, you know, I've, I've treated everything and, you know, got it all set up and it's set for if I need to do remote real-time transmission and all that kind of stuff with all the technical junk that, you know, I'm, that's my thing. I love that stuff, but I'm a giant nerd too. But um, that's kind of the thing where it's like as much as, the sensation may have been slightly isolating at the same time it required a level of upping it certainly required a level of for me at least upping the level of of clearly communicating because you were communicating remotely so it was frequently absent things like you know the obvious stuff facial expressions and so on and so forth um and then sometimes you know cameras will freeze so you have to be you have to think for a second about what it is that you're saying because it, it might not be construed the same way. And you have to listen very carefully because people may say things and you have to not, kind, not that you're tuned out, but you, you have to be very, very clear about what it is that they need or what it is that they're asking for. Um, but it, as certainly as, as terrible as this time has been, it really made me reevaluate, reexamine the way I communicate with people. Um, just on a per not only on a personal level, professional level, but also on a personal level, because of of how that like what is a meaningful con conversation, what is something that really is was essentially prior to this essentially meaningless. Right, um, right. So there was not to be so esoteric about it, but that was something that definitely it's something I contemplate and mull over quite frequently. Mm -hmm. So. Do you have a, a favorite? You've done so much voice acting work. Do you have a, a mm. standout project or a standout character? Uh, family members have asked why I always play bad guys. <laughs> um, I just sort of respond. Perhaps people see something that I don't. Um, uh. Saw Guerrera definitely yeah. is one. Um, the tremendous honor, I, I, hard to explain how I did um, the Clone Wars and then went to see Rogue One. Oh, yeah. And, and, like, I, there was like a Lucasfilm Friends and Family screening where we all went right. prior to the premiere. And right out the gate, Forrest Whitaker is, and I'm just like, my jaw is on the <laughs> ground. And I'm like, oh, my God. Um, Fallen Order is it was a lot of fun. Jedi Fallen Order was amazing because I actually did all the motion capture for that. Oh, and, cool. And, and I did all the dialogue for it. So when you see the game, it's me because I'm, you've met me. I'm kind of like more like a built like a fullback than I am like a running back. Like I kind of got a little, you know, I'm not like a, I'm not doughy, but I'm like a dense kind of individual, right? So I have, you know, I had to basically walk like him, which is not tough because we kind of walk the same way. Um, and then I did all the dialogue and then he came in and did the voiceover and basically did everything that I did. And when I hear it, I'm like, there's some things in there he sounded where he, he, it's like, that sounds like me. And he said to somebody when he did Rebels, he was like, he's like, we're starting to sound a lot like each other when we do this character so it was yeah, a lot. yeah so he and i have yet to meet but um we've both kind of sent messages in passing and stuff somebody else was a lot of fun to play was kevin from steven universe because it, everybody hates kevin right um right. uh i'm trying to think of who else um you know john from the lion guard was a lot of 
was a lot of fun too because uh, Janja Janja was this is based on uh, KRS One, who's a friend mm-hmm. of mine, mixed with this friend of mine who's a Philadelphia Eagles fan who I, who is such a loud mouth. So when you mix two very loud people together and that's and they are highly opinionated and KRS is brilliant, but this guy I had to take from you know, John Jay and the voice and making him kind of like, you know, a little more not quite so swift. It was a lot of fun. So, yeah. Yeah, I've been very, very fortunate. That's so. that's so cool. How do you create? So, like, do you ever steal voices oh, from, time. like, people you know? Like, All the like, time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All yeah. the time. Yeah. <laughs> that's what of that's That is... It's something that really, really will grind some people's gears. But, and I'm not like a, like there are people who are extremely good at mimicking, but what I'll tend to do is sort of more take characteristics of the way people speak. If there's a pace or an intonation or Mm -hmm. um, things, which was a lot of, over the entire um, trilogy of books, that was a lot of what informed those characters was Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. pace, intonation, intensity, um, certainly motivation. Mm-hmm. Again, to go back to Ait Mata, where it was like, like those exchanges that she had, wh- where it was like, I wanted to feel that sense of terror when I've heard certain people I know who are ice, like ice cold water runs in their veins. Mm-hmm. I want to, I want to remember, I want people to feel the sense of terror I had felt when I've been around people like that who are like, I, I don't want to get too into it, but people who let's say dwell on the other side of the law and you're like this person is not wired correctly like <laughs> if this if this goes left it's there i'll get no warning and it will be potentially deadly like this is really yeah. really frightening so i wanted that sense of i'm going to take that person's not i would never mimic their voice because they'd know but <laughs> but to take the that feel of it, yeah, the feel of of going like, uh, like you know, you're in the car afterwards, going like, I, I just need to go home and like, you know, hug a pillow or something because this guy was kind of crazy. That was a little nuts. <laughs> so yeah, I'm. I think uh, one of the reasons why, because you said, uh, you know, your friends and family members ask like, oh, why do you always play bad guys? And I think it's because you have you have this gravity to your voice. Like everything you say, kind of has this like makes you stop and pay attention. And I have to, like, I, I'm remembering back to before we recorded Jade City and they sent me some audition tapes, like little, you know, one minutes, one minute snippets of some of different narrators and, and voice actors. And I just remember listening to yours and being like, oh my God, like this is, a, <laughs> this is the guy, like 100%, like this is the guy. Um, and so I, I like, I remember in like some of my favorites of favorite voices that you've done for my books. I remember you doing Gaunt Ash so well. <laughs> that he was great. That fight was incredible. That fight was so because it was like it was like two giant bulls or bison clashing with like the maximum level of force like unimaginable levels of human being force being applied to each other, which was terrifying. It was terrifying. And, and yeah, that, you know, and even, um, and again, you know, Barrow is a good example because just that, to get that sense of, of there's in everybody's life, there's somebody that you're like, man, why does this person keep (laughs) popping up? Like, and it could be, it could be anything, but it could be, there's also the, um, the one thing that I love, love, love also, and this was kind of, again, going into sort of like the focus in, focus out thing, is that I have two brothers and a sister. So I identified with the Call family, Mm -hmm. not from the sense of being that, but the structure of the Mm -hmm. Call family. Mm -hmm. Um, and the interfamilial dynamics were something that you, that was so, it was almost tactile, how um, incredibly on point where you have this high level of authority externally that they show the world, but Shay will get on Hilo's nerves like oh, yeah. only a sister can. 
Right, right. And then how there is Hilo and Shay and how they their complicated relationship with their father and how it was like everything. It, there's all this stuff tangling the way that they move through the world externally when internally it's there was so much I related to on that level that you captured that that just all of the the messiness of being in a family that's really complicated. And it's interesting to think about how when I'm writing, I often try to strip away this the what is um, the sort of the blunt dialogue and leave a lot unsaid. So I'll take away stuff like and and in order to make a conversation more natural, I'll actually remove words and and try to leave in uh, a lot of subtext that's just sort of implied from the way these characters uh you know look at each other the, the their body language the way you know even even a single relatively mundane statement can carry a different weight when it's between two people with a lot of history and then what you have to do is then like infuse that into like tone of voice and the way that these characters interact and read into the subtext that I've put in there by pulling things out and you're putting it, you're layering it back in with the performance, which is kind of a, like, it's a cool process when you think about it. It's super cool. And I've always thought the way that you, because secretly I'm always hoping that these become movies um, as well as video games. That's just me. But even the way, um, the way Hilo relates to subordinates and what he says with his presence and authority where it's almost like his capability of rage says more than his actual rage. Mm -hmm. So when he's flexing on people who are just kind of backing away slowly where he's making his impression to get things done, the simmering is worse than the explosion. Mm -hmm. Then there's, there was one, I can't remember, it's one where it's, I just remember it distinctly him being in his office and he's playing with the lighter and he's talking to Shay. But just that action of doing that is conveying how he's, he's you can see him setting his jaw and being frustrated by the conversation, but it's mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. but, but having to dignify it in a way that's different than he would talk to anyone else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then him having to show deference in cases when he's talking, you know, to his father right, and right. that's, that's masking a level of profound contempt mm -hmm. and all of it exactly like you said has that cinematic thing of saying how we all speak where we frequently rarely do are we with people who say exactly what they mean all yeah. the time yeah everything is subtext right oh, we've got a few questions i oh, want to make okay. sure we hit them so um we've got a question um for you andrew have you do you have any memorable moments while recording um I remember the oh uh, the eight modest the eight modest fight scene. The eight modest fight scene. I remember we did it, and I had had a much larger coffee than usual, so I kind of had to like kind of <laughs> let me burn off a little bit of energy. So, like I said, like we, I wasn't going in like all bananas crazy, but I remember getting that fight scene done as the last thing before we broke for lunch. And I remember consuming an entire pizza by myself because it took that much energy out of me. Wow. Because I remember, I still to this day, how much it's imprinted on me is, is how you wrote about Shay's wounds. Like how she was injured and how it was, it, it, like it was, I don't know, like the, the, it was so evocative that it left me breathless and drained. And I was like, oh my God. And then, you know, of course, so what did I do? I went and ate an entire pizza. But, <laughs> you know, but the whole thing was, it just took that much energy out of me because the fight was so explosive and then end with, ended with something so terrifyingly sad. And also it was, you were confronted with how delicate her, like how her life hung in the balance. And it was like, oh my God, this is awful. I need to eat about it. <laughs> so I ate a whole pizza. Um, That's awesome. 
but yeah, I mean, quite honestly, the, the, the process itself is, is gratifying is, and rewarding beyond words because you, I leave exhausted all the time in the best possible way because it's an emotional workout. Reading your words is, is like, it's like a, this amazing, fantastic, wonderful roller coaster that is just thrilling and exciting and terrifying and, and profoundly sad and achingly sweet. That when you're done, you're just like you're exhausted. Like I'm exhausted, but in the most wonderful way. Well, I'm delighted to hear that it, because I I just imagine in my mind I'm imagining you being like kind of uh, imprisoned for the like a huge amount of time that it takes to read this this brick. Um, and and so I I wonder like you know do you take breaks like how do you space it out? I hope they're like giving you plenty of time to do this so, i take breaks um i you know and i got snacks so okay. um but there was <laughs> dennis and i did get into it one time because <laughs> and i don't mean to, i don't mean to light him up about this but in the first book it was in the summertime and the booth that he had did not have circulation oh no so about six hours in, and I'm kind of saying, you know, we're about six hours in, and I'm having a little difficulty breathing. Not to put, not trying to say that that's a bad thing, but I'm having a little trouble breathing because I've been locked in a box for six hours. And Dennis, I don't <laughs> think I knew that it was because he opens the door and it's like 62 degrees where he is in the studio control room. <laughs> and he opens the door and it is clearly 25 plus degrees hotter. And he does, I've, tr I've tried to get it right. This is what he does. He go, He's like, goes, oh, really? Hang on a second. Opens the door and he goes, really? Oh, man. Wow. Yeah, it's hot in here. I'm like, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, it's kind of warm in here. You, can we just take a second and literally put you in a sweat box? Uh, yeah, he's like, like, wow. <laughs> wow, that's really warm. And I'm like, yeah, he goes, yeah, we can't have that. And I'm like, no, we cannot. All right, so let's do something about it. So, we, and again, that's why I love Dennis because he, he worked it all out, but he just, there's no way he could have known because he's not in the booth, right? So, right, right. you know, I was like, bruh, I'm like, I'm feeling like, like bread dough proofing up in this piece. You got to do something, okay? Because it's getting a little rugged. So. Oh, man. Okay, another question. What was it like to narrate Lon's parts? Oh. Again. One of the reasons why I love your writing is there are so many things about my own life personally that echoed into that. And Lon reminded me of my homeboy, a couple, my friend Sims, my brother Destro, um, people who I've lost. And uh, Born Swift, like a lot of, there's just a lot of people who have passed away. And it was... <laughs> He's in my family. He represents one of my siblings who, you know, I, it wouldn't mean anything to say who it is now. I mean, because I'm mean, going to say who it is because, you know, and we're all still living, thank God. Um, but that sense of having someone who is like the anchor and now he's gone, it did get a sense where Hilo and Shay felt a little unmoored because Lon was the center and able to pull them in to, to pull Shay towards action, pull Hilo towards reason. And, and that glue that also put, like kind of stuck everything together, the mortar between the bricks. No less important, but not as big a player, but, but definitely no less important. So when he was gone, it was like, it was painfully, like even him dying was really painful. And also how, because it felt undignified. It felt wrong. It felt for someone as, as, as much as he had, his whole life was about striving to bring so many noble things into existence to meet that fate was like, that's not, it's not fair, but life is not fair frequently. And then to have him echo back through the book was like, very bittersweet. It was really super. There was a, a lot of this, a lot of, a lot of emotional stuff tapped into for me that was, was extremely powerful. 
And this is why I'm just, I feel like the luckiest author that, you know, you, this, you just get this book. You know, not every author is lucky enough to say that. And like, that just means a lot. You, let me, listen, I feel honored that you created the most profoundly, viscerally, just, just this world that I literally feel at any moment I could physically step into and smell and taste and, and, you know, go down to the docks and get sticky buns and the whole oh. bit, like every, like the whole thing. It, it just feels like you can almost smell the trees in KCON. Like that's the level of detail that's in there. So I cannot thank you enough for allowing me to, to again, to trust me with your words. Oh, thank you. I, I, I want to ask Candace if we have time to answer these other two questions or, or if we, uh, if we've got to pull the plug, Candace, can you give us a sign? Oh, she says up to us. Okay. So I'll, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'm good. Let's, I'm, I'm, I'm good. If you I'm are good. Andrew, to answer yeah, I'm, these, last, I'm good. these last couple questions. I'm way um, good. Let's see. We've got uh, one. What do you think? Oh, it's for me. What do you think is the future of non-Western inspired fantasy? Do you think it will become more common? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I would say, it has become much more common in like the last um, five odd years ever since, uh, you know, I, I mean, when I was growing up, I, I loved fantasy, but I certainly didn't, um, all, all the fantasy that I consumed was very uh, you know, vaguely medieval Northern Europe, right? So um, when I started writing Jade City, there was very little for me to compare my book to um, in the fantasy genre. And uh, I, I didn't know if it would sell. I was very much like, I don't know, this is a big risk. Um, it's not like the other stuff that I'm, I'm used to in, in the fantasy genre. And since then, I mean, in, in the last five years, the, the genre just exploded. I mean, there's so much more um, diversity of inspiration and in fantasy, uh, you know, whether from different time periods, different cultures, different parts of the world. So yes, I absolutely think that it will become more, it'll, it'll be the norm. Like the, the, uh, the, there'll always be a place for that, um, the, the Tolkien legacy esque inspired world, um, but of, of traditional fantasy, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think anyone who thinks that's all the genre is, is missing out on a ton of great new stuff these days. Um, oh, and then another question, are there any plans for an audio version of the short story Jade Setter of John Loon? Um, so this is, I don't think you know this yet, Andrew, I wrote a novella that's set in the same world as the Greenbone Saga, um, but is like a standalone prequel so it's kind of like a noir mystery uh, novella that's being put out by a different publisher in sort of a limited edition hardback oh, with like wow okay pretty fancy and cool. Um, so that is being published next year, and there is, as far as I know, um, there aren't any plans for an audio version yet. So that still has to be that is that is still potentially up in the card up up for wow. discussion. If you have time in your schedule to narrate a, what? Come a novella, on. let me know. Everything's Let's go back ev to KCON. Everything's <laughs> getting brushed. If that's are you kidding? Everything's getting the broom. If you'd be like, listen, got something to do for my homegirl Fonda. We're doing this. Get All right. <laughs> but um, so without sort of letting anything out, is it is it for is it set like how um how the and this is another part I love about the books because it's the sort of palate cleanser is the interludes where the interludes yeah. hearkened back to this it was like this the subtle tone change where it was the time before this where the all of the con like what led to this splitting and the separation of of the clans and the whole and the everything but is it based in that time it's it's pre jade city so it's it's like uh, it's totally different characters. Oh, but okay, there okay, is, okay. There is a, there are a bunch of cameos. 
So Lon, oh, that's and Aimata and Gaunt Ash, they show up. But um, it's uh, so it's a like a novella length um, little standalone that probably happens like about on like maybe four odd years before Jade City. Oh, that okay. So it's that close. It's not yeah. as far away as the okay. Okay, right, got right, it, got right. It, got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. wow, yeah. I'm down. For, I'm I'm in for that. All I'm right, that. all right. We'll talk later. Well, <laughs> so whoever left that, whoever left that uh, question, you just helped facilitate. You asked if there were plans for an audio version. I said not yet, but there might be. Bam, 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 so bam, thank bam. you. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, those were the questions we got. Um, and let me just quickly, I think, I think we're at, at the hour that Candace promised us. Uh, Candace, is there any, anything else, any last minute questions? That are I there? don't see any more questions that have come up, but I do want to mention because I forgot to mention at the beginning um, that we are uh, giving away a three month Libro.fm membership. Um, So for those of you who don't know, Libro.fm is the indie bookstore version of Audible. So you can um, get a free three months on there, which will give you three credits, which means if you want, you can get the whole trilogy for free (laughs) if you win this. Um, So, yeah, and so there is a link in the chat to a Google form, which is basically just put in your name and your email, uh, and I will check that out after the event and pick someone and email you if you win, Um, and thank y'all so much for watching. I also definitely want to plug books so if you if you want to buy books, um, you can go to our uh, website for this event. Uh, you can just go to tubbyandcoos.com slash special order and click on what you want. Uh, we do have signed book plates uh, that are coming from Fonda. So thank yep. you for sending us those. So if you get an order a physical copy, you can get a signed book plate um, or you can go to Libro.fm and get a, the audiobooks, which are amazing. Um, and thank you, Andrew and Fonda for being here. This was so, so great. It was such a great conversation. And Jade Legacy, comes out November 30th. Um, and so please buy it. It's so good. I can show the cover here. This is what it looks like. I have it. It's right Ooh, here. here I just yes. I just got physical copies in and I've been bugging my editor. I said, can I get the audiobook? Um, my audiobook author's copy because I haven't listened to it yet. And I've got some traveling coming up. Um, and nice. so I've got some time to listen to Andrew. And I, I got to say like, I know authors are sort of split on whether or not they can listen to the audio of their own work. Some of them are like, it's too weird and they don't want to. Um, and I, I love listening to the audio version of the books that Andrew does because it's like I'm experiencing it for the, for the first time myself. Like I know where this story goes. And yet I'm like, like so stressed out. <laughs> and it's, it's like, I mean, it's like it, it, having the adaptate, going through that process of having another creative person put their uh, their their spark onto it just makes it fresh for me. So um, I I'm super excited. I'm as excited as everyone else for the. For and it to all come I out. could and all I could say about this one for anybody who's listening is. Um, this does not lack for suspense. There are it. It starts out like it goes zero to Wu Tang right out the gate. Like there is no stopping. So when you get in the ride, please fasten your safety belts. You know, mind the signs and get ready because it is off like a shot. <laughs> awesome, and I love the color palette as well. For the, oh, for yeah. the series, it's it's yeah, like yeah. the colors are are really great. Yeah, all the Christmas colors okay. now of my children. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> uh, well, thank you all so much for thank you, Candace. Coming. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Yes, thank you, everybody, for watching, and we will catch y'all at the next event. Hopefully, uh, those who are watching will continue to watch events. If you like this, we do a lot of them. So, thank y'all so so much, and uh, we'll see everyone watching next time. Wow.